This program is brought to you by Emory University. Okay, welcome to the uh, to the pan to this panel entitled uh, "The Long Movement to the Wide Movement: Queering Histories of the Civil Rights Black Power Era." Uh, my name is. Let me know if you can hear me. I just want to make sure that. Um, my name is Brett Gadsden. I'm an associate professor of Ameri of sorry. I am associate professor of African American Studies here at Emory University, and I have the great pleasure of moderating this wonderful panel um, of three uh, brilliant scholars. Um, I, I, I'm not going to go down the list of thanks to everybody who's involved in this, um, in organizing this conference. Uh, I just, but I do want to uh, mention three. The Arcus Foundation for their generous funding of this uh, uh, amazing uh, weekend. And um, uh, Leslie Harris and Dona Yarborough, who are have, been, have done miraculous work in putting together, I think, a really dynamic uh, uh, a list of, of panels and brought together uh, panelists from all over the country. And so this is a very exciting uh, weekend for me and I think for our university here. Um, I'm especially uh, privileged to chair this panel, in part for selfish professional reasons. Um, in many ways, I think literary and cultural critics have been trailblazers in LGBT studies. And, but I think this panel, uh, in many ways, kind of builds on a lot of those kind of analytical innovations. And what we'll see is a kind of artful weaving of wonderful social history and political history methodologies with, the, with, with a variety of kind of literary and cultural uh, analytical tools. And so. Um, it's the, the historian in me is especially pleased that, to be a part of this panel. Uh, we have three panelists. Uh, the first is Jennifer Jones. Uh, Jennifer is a doctoral student in the Department of History at Princeton University, where she is completing her dissertation entitled The Fruits of Mixing, Homosexuality and the Politics of Racial Empowerment in the South, 1945 to 1975. And here, Johnson chronicles uh, the, how chronicles the way the different characterizations of gays, gay men and lesbians as they appear in various conflicts, um, uh, campaigns for and conflicts over black racial equality in the South and in the post-World War II era. She is the winner of the Arthur Fondler Award for Best Thesis from the University of Michigan where she completed her master's thesis and has won support for her work from a plethora of offices across her campus. Her paper is entitled, The Charge of Homosexuality, NACP, the NACP Veterans Affairs Department Advocacy for Discharged Veterans, 1944 to 1947. To my right is Kwame Holmes, who joins us from Boulder, Colorado, where he is Assistant Professor of Ethnic Studies at the flagship university there. He is a winner of fellowships from the Carter G. Whitson Institute and the Smithsonian Institute. And he's con currently completing his manuscript entitled Chocolate to Rainbow City, Liberalism and Displacement in the Nation's Capital, 1953 to 2001. His work is an exploration of African American and gay liberalism and black displacement in the nation's capital from the 1950s to the turn of the century. His paper is titled, Fighting the Fag Fascist Faggots, Reverend Douglas Moore and the Perversity of Black Nationalism in the Post-Civil post Rights Washington. To my left is Deborah Gray White. Uh, Professor White is a Board of Governors Professor of History at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And she is a winner of numerous awards. Uh, including a Woodrow Wilson International Center, including uh, fellowships from the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and the John S Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. Uh, the two, she's got a, a long list of, of, of publications, but I'd like to mention two that I actually believe are really foundational texts in African American history and ones that have had a great deal of influence on my 
own scholarship and training. Um, and there, uh, the first is, aren't I a woman, female slaves in the plantation south? And the second is a, a, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful survey entitled, Too Heavy a Load, Black Women in Defense of Themselves, 1894 to 1994. She's also the, the author of a, or, or, or the editor, I should say, of a, of, of a, of a great book. A, a, I think of it as a kind of exercise in professional self-reflection um, called Telling Histories, Black Women in the Ivory. And, it's, and so I think that her body of work speaks to you know, the, 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 the greatness of her scholarship, but also about her particular acumen, about how uh, academe works. Her paper is entitled Out and on the Outs, what the 1990s mass marches tell us about black LGBTs. And it's gleaned from her forthcoming project entitled Lost in the USA, American Identity at the Turn of the Millennium. So I first give you Jennifer Jones. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? There we go, OK. Um, so with that, I'll begin. On May 14, 1944, First Lieutenant Lemuel Brown solicited advice and assistance from Charles Hamilton Houston, the former dean of Howard University School of Law and the architect, thank you, of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People's Legal Strategy, strategy rather, to dismantle de jure racial segregation. Brown, a graduate of Howard University, found himself incarcerated in a military prison for, quote, engaging in an immoral and degrading conversation concerning sex with a white Marine corporal, end quote or as one black army private serving at Fort Riley, Kansas, facing a similar set of uh, charges, put it, quote, the charge was homosexology, end quote. In response to Brown's appeal for help, Houston forwarded his case to William H. Hasty, the civilian aide to the Secretary of War, whom it appears was able to secure the officer's early release from prison. Yet this was not the last encounter between the eminent lawyer and the young man. Over two years later, Brown wrote again to Houston, recounting how his dishonorable discharge prevented him from finding employment and caused, quote, mental anguish, nervous strain, embarrassment, and social ostracism, end quote. He requested Hamilton's thoughts on pursuing, quote, some form of redress from the United States government, end quote. Houston, replying over two months later, did not see, quote, any legal action by which we can get damages, end quote. He concluded, concluded quote, I think you will have to go about the matter in a different way, end quote. The tale of Lemuel Brown both reflects and diverges from the experiences of many servicemen and women, white and black, removed from military service for alleged same-sex attractions during the Second World War and the early years of the Cold War. Men and women who received discharges for homosexuality faced intense social stigma, were denied benefits associated with the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, or the GI Bill as it was known, and had difficulty securing civilian employment. However, many of these veterans fought such discharges by appealing to the federal government and soliciting assistance from civilian organizations. As an African-American veteran discharged for same-sex attractions, Brown labored against homophobia in federal policy, as well as racism that justified uh, racial segregation in the armed forces and also discriminatory treatment towards African-Americans more generally. However, he was one of a dozen black men discharged for same-sex attractions that mobilized the highly organized networks of African-American civil rights activists affiliated with the NAACP to advocate on their behalf. My talk today analyzes the manner in which the Veteran Affairs Department of the NAACP facilitated the discharge challenges of black veterans removed from service for same-sex attractions. Relying primarily upon the extant records of the NAACP, this brief analysis makes an intervention into the small but sort of growing number of historical studies on the imbrication of African American and, and LGBT political engagements, as well as black communal understandings of uh, same gender loving persons. I argue that the Veteran Affairs Department's general campaign to undermine racial discrimination within the um, military and then the administration of veterans' benefits created opportunities for same gender loving veterans to combat homophobia within these same spaces. This revelation diversifies historiographical understandings of African American communal and institutional engagement with the Lavender Scare, or the post-war vilification and persecution of gay men and lesbians that included their removal from military and civilian federal employment, as well as their general um, marginalization within the public sphere. It does so by revealing an alternative set of engagements that differ from the primarily derogatory characterizations of same gender loving people, which increasingly appeared in the black press during the mid to late 1940s. 
This particular episode suggests that far from exhibiting unyielding homophobia, the NAACP, um, during the sort of brief window at the end of the 1940s, engaged with same gender loving persons in ways that were determined in large measure by a desire for racial equality and advancement. So although the NAACP had been on the forefront of combating racial segregation and discrimination in the military before the war, they waited until the latter part of the conflict to establish a department dedicated to the specific concerns of black military personnel and veterans. On October 9, 1944, the NAACP's National Board of Directors established the Veteran Affairs Department to, quote, handle all matters which might be referred to the association to assure Negro veterans their full rights under the GI Bill, end quote. Fully operational in January 1945, the department pursued a wide array of objectives, including lobbying for the desegregation of the armed forces and combating individual instances of racial discrimination within the military. Jesse O. Dedman Jr. was appointed as the Secretary of Veterans Affairs, which was headquartered in the nation's capital. The Howard University School of Law graduate was a veteran of the Second World War and served as a judge advocate at Clamp Caborn, Louisiana, prior to being honorably discharged for a disability. His familiarity with civilian and military law made him an effective advocate for African-American veterans charged with criminal offenses. Denman's legal acumen proved essential to one of the department's most important tasks, challenging the dishonorable and other than honorable discharges of African-American veterans. Black servicemen consistently faced the brunt of military justice during and after the war, receiving longer and more punitive court-martial sentences than their white counterparts. African Americans also received a disproportionate number of other than honorable discharges, including those commonly referred to as blue discharges during and after the war. A blue discharge was an other than honorable administrative discharge used to remove a person deemed, quote, totally unfit for further retention in the military service, end quote. And although this discharge targeted a number of behaviors, it was most often used to remove those suspected of homosexual behavior. Therefore, the blue discharge was strongly associated with homosexuality. These types of discharges undermined many veterans' ability to resume their civilian lives after service. Those holding blue discharges were largely barred from receiving the various, the various benefits associated with the GI Bill. And this was largely the result of the policy of the Veterans Administration, or the VA, uh, which treated these discharges as essentially dishonorable, rendering those who held them ineligible from receiving benefits. This discriminatory policy was compounded for black veterans who, um, especially in the South, were also denied benefits based upon their race. Therefore, in the case of black veterans discharged for same-sex attractions, the overlapping homophobic and racist administrative policies of the VA, as well as the military, proved especially damaging and stigmatizing. The susceptibility of same gender loving persons and African Americans to such discharges makes their appearance in the department's records somewhat unsurprising. However, the Veteran Affairs Department's decision to assist these veterans is notable when placed within the broader context of intensifying opprobrium towards gay men and lesbians. Um, the existence of the department overlapped with the early years of the Lavender Scare, which again was the vilification and persecution of gay men and lesbians in the federal government um, and more generally in the public sphere. And this was intimately tied to sort of the rising anti-communism of the late 1940s. Such pernicious understandings of same gender loving persons were also evident in the black public sphere. A small number of historical studies have suggested that African American public opinion increasingly embraced heteronormativity and exhibited homophobia during the 1940s and 1950s in part to legitimize claims for racial equality. Certainly derisive stories about gay servicemen like quote, sissies get into army despite many precautions, end quote, and quote, sex perverts gave army plenty of trouble, end quote, suggest that editors, journalists, and some uh, readers believe that gay men and lesbians in uniform were a menace to the protection of the nation. Such heterosexism is also evident in the unwillingness of some organizations to assist same gender loving veterans. Army veteran Elon Bruce noted that he had initially sought assistance from the United Negro Organization for Veterans, but turned to the NAACP when he, quote, heard no answer from them, end quote. And this suggests that perhaps the veterans group um, was a bit reticent to assist someone who was discharged for, in their words, homosexual offenses. At other moments, a combination of racism and homophobia may have impeded black veterans' attempts to seek redress. A high-ranking official of the American Legion, um, a white veterans organization, told African-American veteran Henry Nord, quote, you would be wasting your time by asking for a rehearing of your case, end quote, because um, Nord had, quote, admitted homosexual practices, end quote. And this contrasts sharply with the Veteran Affairs Department. 
dead men represented all but one veteran removed for same-sex attractions that sought the NAACP's assistance in amending their discharges in front of the Army or Navy discharge review boards. And the one exception um, where the NAACP did not assist a veteran was uh, with regard to a soldier who had already contested his discharge independently and received an unfavorable result. Um, similarly, the unfavorable outcomes of all of the discharge review trials facilitated by the NAACP indicates the great difficulty in having these discharges successfully changed even with skilled legal representation. And so, unfortunately, given the extant records of the NAACP, Deadman's personal thoughts on same gender loving people um, are very unclear. However, I believe that the department's willingness to take up these cases reflected their larger mission of combating racial discrimination in the armed services and the administration of veterans' benefits. Um, indeed, besides sort of not having Deadman's own personal thoughts on same gender loving people, um, the attitudes of other staff members of the Veteran Affairs Department are also absent. Uh, another sort of um, challenge as a historian is that federal records that may have provided insight into the Veteran Affairs Department's legal challenge of these um, discharges, like the Army and Navy Discharge Review Board records or even the cases of individual uh, servicemen and women, have either been destroyed or are currently inaccessible to academic researchers. However, it appears that the NAACP's conviction that blue discharges were fundamentally discriminatory provided an opening for furthering the appeals of individual vet veterans where racial bias was not a clear determining factor in their dismissal. Many veterans expressed the belief articulated by Assistant Secretary Roy Wilkins in 1945 of the NAACP that, quote, the armed forces were systematically giving Negroes blue discharges for the purpose of defeating their rights under GI legislation, end quote. This perception was also at the heart of the Pittsburgh Courier's intense press coverage of blue discharges in 1945 and 1946, which helped to incite sort of a larger congressional investigation into the Veteran Administration's policy on dealing with veterans uh, who had such discharges. In his public speeches, Deadman encouraged, quote, all Negroes who have received other than honorable discharges to file applications for review of the same, end quote. He also raised questions about the fundamental difference between these, quote, other than honorable discharges and those received from court martial proceedings, end quote. Again, reflecting his familiarity with the ways in which the application of these blue discharges were largely punitive from the point of the military and then even more so from the point of the Veterans Administration. Therefore, the Veteran Affairs Department's policy of challenging blue discharges generally facilitated opportunities for same gender loving veterans to pursue their discharge reviews. Seemingly, a desire to undermine the legitimacy of these discharges outweighed any apparent concern over the alleged cause of such removals from service. And while individual departmental staff members' perceptions of same gender loving people are unclear, uh, correspondence related to two veterans' discharge challenges demonstrates the willingness of local NAACP chapters and officials to assist same gender loving persons that sought honorable discharges. Furthermore, these letters provide insights into the nature of the military's policing of sexuality, the veterans' understanding of sexual identities, and their determination to remove the stigma associated with their separation from service. So in April 1946, Daniel Byrd, the executive secretary of the New Orleans NAACP, brought the case of Elon Bruce to the attention of the Veteran Affairs Department as well as the legal department of the NAACP. According to Byrd, the veteran, quote, admitted, quote, that he is a homosexual. He was born that way. The evidence proves he is that way. He even has dimples, end quote. <laughs> he, um, and he even has dimples as in like double quotes. Um, so the, the NAACP official then asserted that although he personally believed that the military had erred in their induction of Bruce, um, quote, he was not caught in an act of sodomy, end quote, and therefore should not have been discharged as though he were. Instead, um, Bruce, uh, the veteran, uh, quote, stated that when he reached a certain point, he went to the chaplain, frankly discussed his tendencies, and the chaplain sent him to the commanding officer, end quote. Uh, Bruce was promptly discharged as a homosexual. Byrd concluded his letter by suggesting, quote, since the army should never have inducted this man, I think that it may be possible that we could have his induction nullified, end quote. Uh, Bruce solicited assistance directly from Deadman several months later, although his objectives and understanding of his military service uh, contrasted sharply uh, with Byrd's. Bruce asked, quote, if there is a possibility of having my discharge changed, it's blue, end quote. He continued, quote, if so, I'd appreciate it very much. I am not given the same rights as the other veterans as my discharge is blue, end quote. The word blue in both instances is heavily 
underlined in pencil, emphasizing the stigma associated with such discharges. Bruce's desire to have his discharge changed indicates his own conviction that his induction in subsequent military service were legitimate. And again, this contrasts sharply with Byrd's assumption that Bruce should have never served at all or been inducted given his sexuality. Moreover, Bruce's reference to rights conveys his desire to access the financial and educational benefits associated with honorable service and the GI Bill, um, benefits that he would have more than likely been excluded from if his induction were nullified. And while Byrd's formulation of Bruce's claims to a discharge review rested upon the latter sort of restraint, uh, Yeoman First Class Willis Austin of the Navy contested the notion that experiencing same-sex desire made one a homosexual at all. Stationed in Honolulu in 1949, Austin found himself in the Office of Naval Intelligence responding to rumors he was, quote, a sexual pervert, end quote. After a rigorous interrogation, the intelligence officer asked Austin if he had, quote, ever had any relations with a homosexual, end quote, to which he replied, yes. The serviceman referenced encounters, quote, when I was just a kid out of high school and on another occasion in San Diego since being in the service, end quote. This admission was enough to result in his prompt dismissal from the Navy, despite a physician's subsequent determination that he did not exhibit, quote, homosexual tendencies, end quote. Austin's sense of injustice was further sort of raised um, when a witnessing officer asserted that, quote, there's hardly a person living in or out of the Navy that hasn't participated in unnatural sex acts, end quote. Austin's denial of being a, quote, sexual pervert, end quote, and admission to having relations with a homosexual, um, relations with a homosexual is a quote, suggests that he adhered to an understanding of sexual identity that was not rooted in sexual object choice. And historians have documented how in the middle of the 20th century, um, an understanding of heterosexual, homosexual sexual identity um, that was sort of rooted in sexual object choice was beginning to be sort of broadly accepted across the uh, American landscape. However, many men, including Austin, continued to adhere to older understandings of sexual identity in which <coughs> gender behavior and sex role were the primary determinants of a presumed and assumed identity. Now, while Austin's thoughts and his dismissal are quite clear, uh, the correspondence of Noah W. Griffin, an NAACP official that forwarded his case to the national um, office, are less so. Certainly, Griffin believed that Austin's case deserved um, some kind of consideration from the national leadership. And he also encouraged Austin to seek out the assistance of African American Congressman William Dawson of Chicago. Um, Willis Austin was a native of Chicago, and so appealing to his congressman was a sort of tried and true method that gay um, and lesbian soldiers, uh, servicemen and women rather, use more broadly to appeal their discharges. So while Griffin's specific sort of understandings of Austin's, sort of the basis for Austin's appeal are unknown, um, he may have agreed that the veteran should not have been prosecuted uh, because he lacked quote unquote homosexual tendencies. More than likely, however, Austin's desire to quote, get the benefits to which I am entitled and quote, regain my citizenship, end quote, resonated with the official. However, the window for same gender loving black veterans to challenge their exclusion through the civil rights organization was short lived. The Veteran Affairs Department was disbanded at the end of 1948 by the National Board, who assumed that, quote, the work of the Bureau has just about ended, end quote. President Harry S. Truman's issuing of Executive Order 9981, which eventually paved the way for the desegregation of the military, may have been the primary impetus for closing the department. Um, although I should note that Jesse Dedman and one other attorney, Frank Reeves, continued to represent um, uh, discharged servicemen before the Army and Navy Discharge Review Boards through the end of 1950. However, there were other reasons for, to use Dedman's words, quote unquote, retrenchment. The heightened pressures of domestic anti-communism inhibited the scope of the NAACP's vision to affect political change. Rising conservative rhetoric that linked civil rights activism with communism heightened these inhibitions. Moreover, the sort of emerging milieu associated with the Lavender Scare made challenges to the anti-gay policies of the federal government increasingly untenable. So while the Veteran Affairs Department was a short-lived entity, it offered black veterans who were discharged for quote-unquote homosexual offenses an opportunity to contest racist and homophobic federal policies that not only removed them from service, but denied them access to veterans' benefits. The willingness of Deadman and his staff to facilitate such challenges is an important point of intersection in the history of the long civil rights movement and LGBT efforts at self-determination. 
This brief set of engagements suggests that African American political organizations historically may have engaged with same gender loving persons and understandings of homosexuality in ways that were politically efficacious rather than sort of solely or perhaps even primarily shaped by homophobia. Um, and to be sure, my talk today does not suggest that civil rights organizations and black communities did not express homophobic views or present very sort of denigrated um, understandings of gay men and lesbians. Um, certainly, there's a very rich historiography that shows us that is not the case. Um, however, uh, what I hope my talk suggests is that greater historiographical attention to specific political organizations, civic institutions, and individual communities will provide an important counterpart to focusing on the black press in considering how African Americans articulated understandings of same gender loving persons during the early years of the Cold War. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to try and work two screens at once, so I apologize if there's any kind of awkwardness around that. Um, as Professor Gadsden indicated, um, my talk today is drawn from a pivotal turning point in my book project, which is entitled Chocolate to Rainbow City, Liberalism and Displacement in the Nation's Capital. Um, the book is interested in the modern history of Washington, D.C., a city that is simultaneously our nation's capital, uh, the first major U.S. city to have a major black majority um, until 1958, and a constitutionally delimited district without either full congressional representation or full self-governance. Do you see that as sort of a kind of metaphor for African Americans' broad dislocation from citizenship in the United States? And it was once and is still known as Chocolate City, a moniker which particularly speaks to black demographic, cultural, and political hegemony in the DC part of Washington since 1975, George Clinton. Yeah. Um, but I contend that Chocolate City uh, is gone. And DC is now a rainbow city, a multicultural and multinational gay-friendly urban center with a rapidly, rapidly declining black population, a shift that is broadly engendered by the emergence um, of the neoliberal consensus. But the fact of black expulsion in DC and its rapid pace, as you can see from this slide, engender a few critical questions that are relevant to this conference. Namely, how is it that the black, the black people from Chocolate City can be occurring in plain sight and without much resistance in a city whose political culture is deeply enmeshed within, within identity politics and particularly the politics of the American civil rights, black power, and sexual liberation struggles. Between 1910 and, 19, and 2010, as you can see, over 94,000 or a quarter of, of black Washingtonians either died or left the city and they were replaced by 51,000 whites, 21,000 multiracial individuals, maybe the Q&A can talk about that, uh, and 10,000 plus new Asian residents. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, 91% of the city voted for Barack Obama in his re-election campaign in 2012, and Democratic primaries remain the only game in town. As the current contest between two generations of gay politics for the Ward 1 seat indicate, and the recent bitter 2010 primary between Vincent Gray and Adrian Venti point to, Political currency in DC is primarily earned through a candidate's ability to connect themselves to current or past struggles against minor minoritarian oppression. And so one of the things my project is trying to unpack is the contradiction that lies in the simultaneity of the triumph of racial and sexual liberalism in DC and the fact of black displacement from the city. Today I'm gonna to tell you a small part of that story via the rather ignoble end of Reverend Douglas Moore, a charismatic black nationalist preacher particularly popular in, dis in the district's most impoverished wards, who should have been, I think, DC's mayor, uh, not because I like him, but because of historical trends, uh, in the 1980s instead of Marion Barry. But Moore had a really spectacular fall from grace during the 1978 city elections. And um, I argue that fall represents a key turning point in black and gay liberalism's relationship to black displacement, at least that's what I hope that you'll be convinced of by the end of this talk. <laughs> um, so, because this is about the death of Reverend Douglas Moore's political ambitions in Washington, I thought we should begin um, with a wake, or at least his political wake. Um, so after Moore's loss in 1978, he tried to run again uh, in a special election in 79 to fill Marion Barry's old council seat. Barry had just won the mayor's office. Um, and as you can see from this extremely shady flyer, the Gertrude Stein Democratic Club, the first gay lobbying group in the nation's capital, was thrilled that Moore would be defeated twice in a row. So they held a wake for his political career uh, at the Eagle in exile. Um, 
So why did the club believe that Moore's political death would confirm that DC's gay community was, quote, here to stay as a political power in Washington, end quote? Well, as it turns out, Reverend Moore had spent a significant time in 1977, 1978, branding himself as the candidate for district residents who wanted to roll back unprecedented gains in gay rights in DC during the 1970s, which you can see illustrated on this slide. Um, and though I can't sort of go into it now, all of these gains had Marion Barry as sort of a key organizing force to get these bills passed. Um, so Moore's 1978 campaign was organized around ridding DC of the three Gs, grass, guns, and gays. Um, at some campaign events, he would switch gambling and grift in, but gays was always part of that sort of triumvirate. Um, after learning that the council had passed a resolution commemorating Gay Pride Day on the same day as Father's Day in 1976, Moore reached across the aisle to the district's white Catholic leaders to lobby the council against repeating the same mistake in subsequent years. In 1978, Moore had fruitlessly introduced bill after bill, hoping to rescind the Metropolitan Police's recent relaxed stance on gay cruising, to reinstitute the ban on gay men and lesbians teaching in DC public schools, and to strip sexual orientation as a protected category from DC's anti-discrimination ordinance. All of these initiatives failed. When the council failed to authorize Moore's plan for a public referendum on gay rights law, he reportedly exploded on the council floor, claiming that a number of his council colleagues had been bought and sold by, quote, the fascist faggots. Now, as shocking as his, as his behavior seems to us, there's perfectly good reason to believe that Moore's efforts should have worked. DC, as we heard last night, is a southern city at a time when that phrase communicated broad disapproval of gay communities. Moreover, all over the country, anti-gay politicians and referendum were succeeding, think Anita Bryant. And as the three Gs indicate, Moore was by no means a one-issue politician. He was concerned with illegal drug use and inner city violence, issues that galvanized the 1978 strike of DC transit workers. And moreover, as we can see from his 1978 campaign flyer, which I found when I bought his self-titled book on Amazon, someone had stuck it in there, I was like, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, Moore was also a powerful advocate on issues vitally important to working class residents, namely rent control, utility bills, and most importantly, the displacing consequences of land speculation. So given all of that, and I know it was a lot, I argue that Moore's decline is the result of, of a profound reorganization of the relationship between perversion and the state in post-civil rights America, one which less often punished those seeking state power for their associations with sexual deviance and increasingly crippled political leaders that deviated from or resisted the middle class reclamation of the urban core. As a range of settler colonial scholars from Scott Morganson to TJ Talley have noted, settlement projects rely upon the heteronormative notions of sexual and cultural reproduction of the settler class. In the nation's major cities, and particularly in its chocolate cities, the federal abandonment of great society programs in the 1970s meant that the settlement and reproduction of the middle class in the city was broadly understood as the only way to bring dead cities back to life. In that context, those political movements and individuals who opposed the middle class reclamation of the city were framed as perverse. And even as the cities were governed by progressive coalitions that included African Americans and openly gay populations, two groups historically understood as the root cause of the immorality and failure of the American city in the 20th century. In the case of Reverend Moore, media coverage of his campaign against gays, sexual morality, and land speculation were increasingly paired with discussions of his paranoia about his enemies and his jealousy of Marianne Barry, who so easily reproduced the discourse of black power while endorsing, um, as we'll see later, some sort of anti-black uh, residency policies. Indeed, it is the ubiquity of, of rhetoric around Moore's paranoia and jealousy that sort of turns the theoretical crank of this essay. During the sort of long era of homosexuality's classification as a mental disorder, <laughs> and beginning with the publication of Sigmund Freud's 1922 essay, Certain Neurotic Mechanisms in Jealousy, Paranoia, and Homosexuality, many psychoanalysts argued that jealousy and paranoia, particularly around a wife's infidelity, were symptoms of sub sublimated homosexual desire. We see manifestations of this belief within the popular parlance around homophobia today, right? It often reveals internal homo homosexual desire. Yet as historian Peter Haggerty points out, the issue of paranoia's relationship to sexual and mental perversion was taken up by subsequent Freudian analysis, like Floyd O'Do and E.M. Wright, who believed that sexual deviants were paranoid because, quote, the homosexual, uncertain of his social status with others, is constantly exposed to disapproving social attitudes, end quote. Or psychologist William Wheeler, who wrote that homosexuality was <coughs> accompanied by, quote, paranoia, 
derogatory attitudes towards women, feminine identification, anal interests, and interest in physical relationships between like beings. The latter point, an interest in physical relationships between like beings, takes on a different valence within the constitutionally delimited boundaries of the District of Columbia. And within Reverend Moore's nationalistic approach to issues of black uh, residential security in DC. In that context, it becomes possible to imagine the way notions of a homosexual paranoia rooted in a desire for like-minded sexual bodies might travel <coughs> from the pages of psychological journals or even Psych 101 classrooms into articles and coverage of Moore's black nationalist paranoia around um, a desire to be closer to similar racial and cultural bodies in the city. Now, I can't really prove that liberal journalists like Juan Williams <laughs> who covered Moore's campaign, he was a liberal in the 70s, liberal, like Juan Williams who covered <laughs> Moore's campaign, <laughs> and he was merciless. Um, we're familiar with Freudian psychoanalysis. Nonetheless, their consistent willingness to analyze and diagnose Moore speak to the ways in which discourses which once stigmatized sexual deviance were now assembling around black heterosexuals and movements that disrupted middle class, urban settlement, and cultural reproduction. So in the longer essay here, I sort of narrate Reverend Moore and Marianne Barry's political history in DC, until 1975, all of which has to be cut for time. Uh, but let's sort of take up the story again in 1975, which was a good year for Reverend Moore. Um, he had just received the most votes in a 19 1974 city election for one of four at-large council seats, which were determined by a citywide vote. And it was clear that Moore was really popular. He had the potential to win the council chairman job and also the mayoral position, I think, in 1978. But even as the city was sort of excited about the 1975 city council, because it was dominated by veteran civil rights activists, change was afoot in the District of Columbia. The terms of the 1973 Home Rule Act, which had paved the way for local elections, was the first sign of trouble. Though civil rights activists celebrated the law as a victory for self-determination, Congress retained their control over the district budget, making any laws passed by the city council subject to the whim of congressional lawmakers. The Nixon and then Ford administration's divestment from the Great Society that sort of left DC um, being forced exclusively to homeowners and property taxes as a means of financing their city without federal control. This fact did not uh, go unnoticed by many black Washingtonians who understood the need for homeowner taxes as being a, a sort of initiative against their own residential security. So when Moore in his, here we go, when Moore sort of pushed back in 78 with his campaign for city council chairman, this is the campaign that sort of uh, crashes and burns, he warns African Americans of a plan to push black people out of Washington, D.C., uh, and he was not, a, not alone in this feeling. Though unacknowledged by D.C. scholars, the plan, as it was known and is known, is a widespread conspiracy theory in black Washington. But like many conspiracy theories, evidence of its origin are difficult to locate. Most people say they first heard P.D. Green joke about it on the radio. In terms of the broader public, the first evidence of anxiety about the plan that I found was in the Washington Afro-American in 1974, when an unnamed black woman told local activist and DJ, and I'm not joking when she says this, quote, they whites displaced us from Georgetown and Southwest, they're now moving us out of Shaw, which is just east of DuPont Circle, if you're not familiar with DC. Uh, she goes on to say, quote, Georgetown and Southwest used to be 90% black, blacks in DC will be on a reservation like the Indians soon, unless we get ourselves together, end quote. There was a plan to have DC 10%, oh sorry, the quote continues. There's a plan to have DC 10% black, 90% white by the year 2000. So I mean, it's kind of right in a really weird way. Um, <laughs> and it was really easy to believe such a plan existed, especially when people like Robert uh, Linoz, president of the Washington Board of Trade, who you see quoted here in Moore's uh, campaign plan, but were kind of so helpful to openly declare on the front page of the Washington Post um, that quote, in the next decade, the district will be solidly middle and upper class, with the poor having been pushed into the suburbs, end quote. In an odd bit of synergy, some white gay Washingtonians were saying similar things in the late 1970s. In 1977, writing for Christopher Street Magazine, Edmund White published a travelogue on a recent trip to Washington, D.C. that was later released in a 1980 collection called States of Desire, Travels in Gay America. In White's essay, he has two anonymous sources, one is an anonymous black bisexual man who I have subsequently determined was A. Billy Jones Hennon, co-founder of the DC Coalition of Black Gays and Lesbians. The other anonymous source is a white gay man who was quoted as saying the following. I love Washington. In Philadelphia, most guys in a gay bar are high school graduate, if that. Here they all have college degrees. They're young, they're well paid. 
Of course, it's a company town, and everyone has to be minimally discreet. But you must also remember that Washington has the biggest gay population percentage-wise in the country. Whites are only 26% of the population in DC right now, but by the end of the century, we'll be 50%. The prices of houses are, so, are doubling every other year. The blacks are being forced out. This is in 1977. Um, so indeed, the similarity of the rhetoric between the rhetoric of the Board of Trade uh, and Edmund White's anonymous gay male informer reflects less a kind of secret cabal between real estate and, and gays and more, around, not my more, but more, something else. Uh, the consensus of that, that DC was, quote, a wide open town, which was a common phrase used in the late 1970s. In plain sight, a range of interests, including black middle class liberals, uh, white gays, and the Board of Trade, had their eye on the city, uh, on the areas of the city populated by the poor and were quite clear in their intentions to redevelop it. The immediate coverage of the plan as a conspiracy theory of the 1980s in particular always dismisses the theory as the result of the insular paranoia of DC's black population, much in the same way that, more, that was more was also dis dismissed in those similar kinds of ways. Um, and indeed, Moore was sort of the plan's biggest uh, political backer in the late 1970s. Uh, so even though Moore went for council chairman in 1978, he really understands his primary opponent as Marion Barry, and he uses the plan to attack Barry both for being sort of sold out to white uh, real estate developers, but also as being sold out to um, uh, the gay community. So in his, seven, his, in his 1978 self-titled book, which is called The Buying and Selling of DC City Council, he murders his attack on Barry's close relationship with white gay men and real estate developers. In the book, Moore devotes an entire chapter, this is from his book, um, to the issue of property taxes and the effectiveness of the business lobby of resisting uh, property tax reform with the majority black DC council. Um, and this is what he says, quote, unfortunately, it seems that local business interests are not the only ones which, that know which of your representatives has political morality for sale. On the next pages, you will see one, two pages from the April 1978 copy of The Blade, Serving Gay Men and Women, and two, Mr. Barry's bill of April 1978, again, looking out for the interests of his newest contributors. Moore goes on to say, quote, as before, public interest is relevant to him when it conflicts with the private interest of his contributors, end quote. Moore's clever turn of phrase there was an emphasis on private con interests of gay con contributors was that a broad chapter on various favoritism towards uh, the real estate industry all speak to the cathexis that informed Moore's belief that the fascist faggots were sabotaging his campaign. The term revealed that the white gay men who are, were kind of represent representational bridge between Moore's concerns about vice and morality on the one hand, and his anxiety surrounding the potential displacement from the, uh, of African Americans from DC. It also speaks to Moore's understanding of the sort of classical fascist state's preferential treatment for private property, and refers to the perception that fascism engendered sexual decadence among the elite by shielding them from public scrutiny. And yet for all that, his phrasing also speaks to the implicit and explicit ways some white gay activists and residents were joining Barry and the Board of Trade support for black displacement. By the time Moore attempted to use white gay men as a scapegoat to galvanize political support against Marion Barry, Barry had already grabbed the reins of pragmatic civil rights activism while implicitly and explicitly aligning with the aggressive land, land reclamation in the nation's capital. In earlier decades, Barry's coalition with white gays would have ruined his political career and speculation into his own sexual proclivities. Now, the media rumor mill circulated around Moore's supposed mental instability in ways that seemed to rationalize clearing out the urban core. For example, derisive coverage of Moore's assault and Mike Tyson-style biting of a district employee in their shared office parking lot mirrored, sensation, <laughs> it's true, mirrored sensational coverage of the criminal behavior of the uh, Washington poor that speculators hoped to evacuate from the city in subsequent decades. To connect these things is not, I argue, the ravings of an unhinged mind, but a sober analysis of the pernicious ways lifestyle liberalism worked in concert with the rhetoric of black liberals to advance the interest of land um, developers. Uh, sort of skipping ahead, by the 1979 special election for Barry's vacated council seat, which is where the uh, talk began with that flyer, Moore's own political advisors were framing his candidacy as a kind of redemption, where Moore would put aside the emotional responses to fringe issues like gay rights and gambling. Moore's campaign coordinator, Mary Nickian, told the press, quote, well, there are a lot of people who would support him, but he didn't, but didn't like the emotional issues, uh, uh, rather, but didn't think the emotional issues are that important, end quote. This move to 
feminized Moore's previous antics is another illustration of the migration of Freudian psychoanalysis into the political discourse within local politics. And despite Nikki Hickian's, Nick, Hickian's valiant efforts, um, the, the flyer showed earlier proved important. A year after losing a special election, Moore was sentenced to federal prison for violating the terms of his probation in relation to the aforementioned assault on a district employee. So, in conclusion, my findings here differ from recent historical scholarship on the specific terms of black gay coalition in urban politics uh, towards um, the end of the civil rights movement. But also, I disagree kind of sharply with historiographic trends around the long civil rights era. Operating within the long movement uh, framework, Kevin Mumford, for example, has framed black gay coalition in Philadelphia as the inevitable outcome of the capacious rhetoric of civil rights of racial liberalism. Yet in its dismissal of Reverend Moore, that same coalition's efforts, uh, sorry, that same coalition offers rhetorical resources to those seeking to expel black underclass, a population whose presence in the city was understood as being bad for business. This group, I argue, those who were expelled were actually queer in the Kathy Cohen sense, including familiar sexual minorities, most only sex workers, but also poor residents dependent upon rent control. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> It's really something to be somewhere where you can be yourself, said 41-year-old Alice Stilbeck at the 2000 LBGT Millennium March on the Washington Mall. Her girlfriend, 48-year-old Betsy Applegate, piped in, and where you can be in the majority. The couple had come from Huntsville, Alabama, and for them, it was an understatement to say that the experience was both liberating and exhilarating. Ah, Applegate side, it's like breathing. 15-year-old mm. biracial Troy Curtis had had a similar experience at the 1995 Million Man March, having been ostracized by both blacks and whites who claimed he was not one of them. He found peace on the Washington Mall on October 16th. Quote, I felt the kind of love I have never felt in my life, he exclaimed. It felt so good to belong for once to the majority, to look around and see a sea of black faces. Charlene Ryan, a great-grandmother from wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania, felt the same kind of love in Philadelphia at the 1997 Million Women March. I feel connected, she said. I feel like I'm meeting with family. Black LBGTs went to the Million Man March of 1995, the Million Women March of 1997, and the 93 and 2000 LBGT marches, searching for the same kind of inclusion and renewal. They were searching for the peace that Curtis found, the connection that Ryan found, the freedom that Dilbeck, Dilbeck and Applegate found. They wanted to be part of the LBGT community and the black community. And like W.E.B. Du Bois, who spoke of his tunis almost a century before, they did not want to forsake either part of themselves. They were vocal about their needs and desires and what they brought to both communities. Some found the community they were looking for, <laughs> others did not. Almost always, the community <laughs> they found was problematic. The reality, sadly enough, was that even though black LBGTs were out and vocal at the African American and LBGT marches, they remain on the outs in both communities. Being out. Black gay men and lesbians really do exist. We are invisible, and that invisibility promotes a cycle of shame and fear, restricting the healthy development of black gay men and lesbians, said Ernest E. Height in an article entitled, Lift the Ban on Gay Men and Lesbians in the Black Community. Our presence as openly gay men and lesbians will counter the assumption that we do not exist or do not contribute to our community. Staying home or marching incognito colludes with those who wish to keep us invisible, was the message of the National 
Black Gay and Lesbian Leadership Forum regarding the Million Man March. Dennis Holmes felt the marches provided an opportunity to provide positive images for black gay youth. For Darren Hutchinson, not marching only fed into the hands of those who felt that homosexuality was inherently abnormal, undesirable, and unblack. And because it allowed racist acts against black gays to go unrecognized and unpunished, it weakened the whole project of anti-racist political activism. Hutchinson also faulted the Million Man Gathering for embracing patriarchal familial st structures and male domination over women. And about the black family, Barbara Smith wrote, quote, homosexuality is not what's breaking up the black family, she wrote, homophobia is. Black gays also criticized LBGTs. When Tom Bean reflected on a, the 1993 San Francisco Pride Parade, he described his experience as akin to, quote, being a raisin in a sea of sour cream, unquote. White gays, he concluded, were, quote, willing to accept black invisibility, second-class black citizenship, the racism of gay skinheads, the National Socialist Gay League, and gay white Republicans. Mm -hmm. Barbara Smith wrote that, quote, wealthy gay white men and those white lesbians with sufficient class privilege and lack of feminist politics don't care about racism, brute police brutality, poverty, homelessness, or violence against women. Others pointed to the way white gays often led the gentrification of poor black neighborhoods. When white gays touted the diversity of the committees that organized the 93 and 2000 Washington Mole marches, the fact that they were multicultural and purposely designed to represent African Americans, blacks like Don Thomas, editor of BLK, retorted that blacks were made visible at national high profile political events, but few were involved in running the actual day to day operations of the thousands of large and small lesbian and gay organizations across the country. Black gays also faulted white LBGTs for their glib equation of black and gay civil rights, whereas white LBGTs were more likely to see black and gay oppression as the same, black LBGTs emphasized similarities in the means of social control while pointing to the subtle and glaring differences between black and gay oppression. In sum, black gays and lesbians were earnest in their desire to be one with the LBGT and black communities. Most understood that they themselves were not a monolithic group, but they also understood that being out posed unique hazards for them in both the gay and black worlds. They understood that they straddled both worlds and that to be comfortable in each, they had to be accepted by both. Out at the marches. Although each march had a political agenda, more or less, it's a whole another chapter, um, <laughs> the political concerns of all of the marches, including those of LBGTs, black LBGTs, did not exist independent of their emotional need to live more comfortable and satisfying lives. In other words, the very personal and emotional was political. For black LBGTs, the issue of physical safety loomed large. Before the 93 march, for example, Nadine Smith, one of the African American March co-chairs reported that threatening calls against gays and lesbians had increased. In 1992, the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force reported that violence against gays and lesbians had increased 172 percent since the 1987 National March. As Tom Bean noted, gay skinheads and Nazi types were tolerated by white gays whose white privilege allowed them to ignore the issue of black safety. In fact, a few months after the 93 March, Marlon Riggs, the appointed Grand Marshal of the San Francisco Gay Pride Parade, was greeted with intimidating hostility and rebuke by the white gay male who was assigned to drive him. Potential for violence existed in black America as well. In Chicago, the ad hoc committee of proud black lesbians and gays was at first denied a permit to march in the 1993 
annual African American Bud Billiken Parade because, as the publisher of the Chicago Defender argued, they would, quote, incite negative and confrontational behavior from the general public, unquote. After much wrangling, they did march in the August parade, but they were probably mindful of the report issued by the Chicago Horizons Community Services Anti-Violence Project, which reported that violence against LBGTs was up 20% in 1992, with much of the increase coming on the predominantly black South Side. In Harlem, when 15 black men and women marching under an LBGT banner marched up the Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard in the 2000 African American Day Parade, police were alerted because the group was being followed by bottle-wielding homophobe shouting anti-gay epithets. The issue of violence raised its head at the Million Man March where black-on-black -black male violence was a concern of every attendee, not just LBGTs. In fact, black-on-black -black male assault had reached such alarming proportions that ending the violence in black America was a reason for holding the march in the first place. Cleo Monago, founder of Black Men's Exchange, wrote that everyone was full of, quote, whisper, wonder, and worry about the safety of a million black men in D.C. Monago was heartened when he came across a group of same gender-loving men, quote, donned with pink triangles, gay pride placards, and gay rainbow flag cutouts of the African continent, unquote, who were treated respectfully by the black men around them. Monago reported that even though the men surrounding them gawked at the two SGLs who were locked in what Monago called a more than brotherly love embrace, and despite the fact that Monago saw no other contingency of black men whose flag, quote, steeped in white dominated ethos was carried by a white gay, quote, not a harsh word was exchanged. While there was no violence at any of the marches, it cannot be said that black LBGT psyches were spared. Freelance writer Eric Washington, for example, was alienated at the 93 LGB march by white gays whose bare backs displayed palettes of white skin lined with raised pink welts who were accompanied by a tall leather-clad master wielding a 20-foot bullwhip. For Washington, it was another sign of the, quote, pressure on black lesbians and gays to conform to the white folk ways of the gay community. A comparison of the LBGT and black marches reveals that the leaders and speakers at the gay and lesbian marches were more sensitive to issues of diversity than those at the issues of, um, than those at black marches. This is not to say that the gay marches were unproblematic. The 2000 Millennium March was especially contentious as the diversity on the podium masked the movement's turn to conservative assimilationist values that made racial diversity and anti-racism secondary to issues of gay marriage, child adoption, and equality in the military. Still, at the 93 and 2000 marches, black LBGT spoke from the podium about both parts of their identity. In contrast, at the black marches, no out LBGTs were allowed to speak. Cleo Monago was supposed to speak at the Million Man March, had prepared his speech about black diversity, but was pulled from the program at the last minute. And at the Million Woman March, intolerance from the podium was pervasive enough for Sheila Alexander Reed, executive director of the nonprofit association Woman in the Life, to be fearful. Instead of instilling sisterhood, said Alexander Reed, the unchecked tolerance was quote unquote scary to those of us considered outside of the mainstream. She thought it counterproductive to debate as podium speakers seemed to be doing quote who was and was not a real African woman. Daunted, she wasn't sure which was more upsetting, the statements or the cheers that followed them. Neither march even tried to reach out to black LBGTs. Controversy arose early at the Million Woman March when word circulated that Angie and Debbie Winans, the youngest members of the popular gospel singing family, 
were going to sing their new song, It's Not Real, It's Not Natural. A patently homophobic response to Ellen DeGeneres' coming out, the song preached that homosexuality was against God's principles. When an interviewer from the Philadelphia Inquirer asked Paula S. Peebles, the program committee chairwoman, about the controversy surrounding the group and the song, Peebles replied that the march was an interdenominational event with no single religious perspective. She said that all women of African American descent were welcome, but then, with not sensing the irony of her statement, she flatly added that the march was, quote, not dealing with issues of sexual orientation. <laughs> to people's credit, the song was in sung, but there was a general silence on issues of homosexuality at the Million Woman March. The same was true two years earlier at the Million Man March. Given Louis Farrakhan's well-known homophobia, black LBGTs did not expect him to be welcoming or to acknowledge them positively. Yet they probably expected more from Jesse Jackson, Benjamin Chavis, and Joseph Lowry, all of whom supported the 1993 LBG march. In 1984, Jesse Jackson had welcomed gays and lesbians into his Rainbow Coalition. And in 93, he acknowledged that LBGTs were, quote, African American, Latino, and white that they were of all religions and found in all socioeconomic strata. He noted that homophobes were usually racist, that HIV AIDS was ravishing African Americans and LBGTs. From the 93 podium, Benjamin Chavis, the recently elected president of the NAACP, promised LBGTs that the oldest civil rights organization in the country will quote unquote stand with you against all forms of discrimination and, just and injustice and ask LBGs to stand with blacks. In February of 1993, the NAACP Board of Directors issued a resolution supporting the elimination of the ban on homosexuals in the military and supporting their rights to live free of discrimination. But at the Million Man March, neither Jackson, nor Chavis, nor Lowry, nor anyone else acknowledged even the existence of homosexuality let alone black LBGTs. They talked about black manhood, the black family, violence in African America, and about unity, a subject I will return to in a minute, but not black sexual diversity. The NOI's Minister of Health, Ali Muhammad, spoke of HIV AIDS without so much of a mention of homosexuality. Perhaps Lowry was referencing LBGTs when he noted that Black people had to free themselves from what he called the quote unquote abuse of our sexuality, but the reference was too oblique to know what he was talking about. <laughs> Interestingly enough, Jesse Jackson seemed to be conscious of the omission. His published four page speech did contain one line wherein he directed black Americans to fight against racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, anti-Arabism, Asian bashing, homophobia, and xenophobia. Yet standing at the Million Man March, he dropped the word homophobia from the list of isms that black America had to stand against. In sum, there was no explicitly expressed homophobia at the Million Man March, as some black LBGTs had feared. But there was no acknowledgement of black LBGTs, period. The silence was truly deafening. Uh, I'd like to conclude with a few observations about black LBGTs in the marches. First, what Donald Suggs of the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation said about blacks and gays held true at the marches, especially the black marches. Quote, when the black community addresses the gay community, they address the white gay community. Conversely, the white gay community addresses the black community as straight, unquote. This is one way to explain the bifurcation existed, exhibited by Chavis, Jackson, and Lowry, and the insensitivity of the Wine and Sisters. On the other hand, were the politics of expediency. Most probably, Chavis, Jackson, and Lowry did a cost analysis, and consciously or not, figured that they gained little and lost a lot by being inclusive especially at the Million Man March, where men were being encouraged to be sensitive, 
and even affectionate towards other men. Second, even though several white gays reference blacks in their speeches at the LBGT marches, the assimilationist tendencies of both white gays and black straights almost guarantee black LBGT exclusion. The black marches were, in part, about showing America just how normal African Americans were. They were good fathers and mothers who valued patriarchal households. They were hardworking, law-abiding citizens who deplored violence and who were truly committed to social, economic, and political uplift. LBGTs were saying much the same thing. They pronounced themselves mainstream, upstanding citizens who could be and were devoted partners, good parents, and citizens who could be counted on to defend America if granted equality in the military. They were normal Americans. Like white suffragists and labor unionists at the turn of the 20th, 20th century, many white LBGTs eschewed the issue of racism for fear it would hurt their own chances for freedom. Third, if the majorities of the black and LBGT communities even tried to come together in some sort of coalition, as they in fact tried to do in the 1990s, the Christian right was standing there to make sure that the two communities stayed as far apart as possible. <laughs> Beginning in the early 90s, especially in 1993, the Christian right devised a strategic plan to use black churches in their fight against LBGTs. Finally, all of the marches were about unity. Marchers and podium speakers call for unity in voting, unity for social cohesion, unity for economic progress, physical safety, and political power. The problem, of course, with unity is that it requires, as Audre Lorde once wrote, mutual stretching, mm -hmm. for seldom does unity allow for difference. Indeed, there is something inherently contradictory in calling for solidarity and celebrating difference at the same time. Black LBGTs went to both of their communities and laid claim to their difference. It should come as no surprise that the majority in these communities had not yet stretched enough to unconditionally welcome them. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.